Today, I got a really cool Lost Home casting build that I'm going to do. And it's going to be building basically essentially a snap gauge for a motorcycle mechanic friend of mine that lives down the street. This tool here specifically is going to check the stretch on bolts to see how much torque is actually put to the bolt. This is more of a high performance specific tool. What I love most about the Lost Foam casting process is, is you could essentially build a lot of this with really basic tools. You don't need a fancy CNC machine like I have. All you need really is a hot glue gun, some patience, a knife, and some sandpaper, and you can be pretty close off to the races. The next ingredient, although it's not really necessary, is, is some drywall mud that's cut down with some water. And it's basically cut down to give you a bit more of a consistency. And if you leave it sit too long like I did, it's going to settle to the bottom. So we're just going to mix it up very gingerly here. And we're going to dip this part in the slurry. Now, one of the challenges that I've had when I've been dipping it in the slurry is actually there's little air bubbles that are actually entrained in it. And that's where the blower comes in. By actually blowing on the surface of it is, it'll expose those little tiny air bubbles and then you can re-dip it again and do it one more time just to double check. Now, I'm going to leave these on the laundry line and let them dry out overnight. After letting it sit in the shop overnight, now we can flash this furnace up and we can get things rolling along here. The next step in the whole process is, is to grab these dry parts out of the shop here and take them out to the sandbox and play in the sand. Okay, well, it's not quite that easy, but it's pretty much that. I've got a box of just regular sand that we're going to bury these foam parts in. So with this regular sand, I'm just going to throw maybe two or three inches on the bottom of this pail. The purpose of this is to give a bit of the buffer so that the foam isn't sitting on the bottom of the pail. Kind of makes sense, right? And this is also going to help hold up the parts while we're filling up the rest of the pail with the sand. One of the things that I absolutely love about Lost Foam Casting is, is it's rapid prototyping. I mean, I can actually make something out of foam before I invest a whole lot of time into machining it and using aluminum. And I can cut out a lot of mistakes that come in there. And speaking of mistakes, well, <laughs> perhaps I'm being a little bit too rough with this today. But it's a pretty easy fix with the glue gun. And we could be back off to the races in no time here. And if you have bigger parts, that's where we could run into trouble with doing what I'm doing here is we can actually distort our parts a little bit by packing the sand down. Now, speaking of packing the sand down, I'm gonna grab the recip saw here and I'm just gonna vibrate the sand down. Now, what's actually happening here is, as we vibrate the sand, it's actually a form of packing everything down. Now, these two soup tins that you see me put here, this is gonna be the reservoir for the molten aluminum. Now, this is super important because this is gonna give us some head pressure when we pour that molten aluminum in there and it's actually keeping the walls of the sand back. Now, once again, the most beautiful thing about this whole thing is we can rapid prototype stuff and if we make any mistakes, like I did in my last casting, we can easily throw them into the melting pot and turn it back into another cool part again. My whole foundry isn't really a high-tech thing. The burner, there's actually a video on that if you want to check that out. The burner's from an old oil-fired furnace, and it's just modified in a couple little ways, and you can be off to the races. And that's right, the crucible that you're seeing here is essentially just a crucible that I welded up out of some big square tubing, and then I put a little crossbar and drilled some holes in it. It's pretty darn basic. I mean, we're not making space-age parts here, so I'm not really worried about any of the carbon leaching into the aluminum or any of that other stuff that people... <laughs> people really get bogged down with in all the details. Really, we're just out here having some fun and making some parts. And that was also a good time to say as well, if you're new to the channel, I have a bunch of other videos that you might like to, maybe how to build a burner, how to make some signs, how to machine in the shop. There's quite a multitude of different videos. You should check out the channel when you get a chance. But in the meantime, let's pour this and make some really cool parts. Now, if I hadn't mentioned this earlier, casting, well, casting obviously can be dangerous. So if you decide to do this as well, make sure you wear the proper PPE. Not only is that wearing the proper, you know, like apron and boots and what have you, it's also wearing the right respirator and gloves. A lot of this foam is kicking off some kind of really nasty chemicals if it's incomplete burnt. And that's why I have an organic respirator on. 
One of the cool things also is with the leftover aluminum with lost foam casting is you can just simply pour it right on top of the casting here and just before it solidifies you can just come back through with a poker stick and you can actually mold it kind of like putty and cut it up so it's pretty easy to use. And speaking of safety gear, it's probably a good idea that we put on some gloves because this is still a little bit hot. Even though it's been sitting in the pot for about 20 minutes, it's still kicking off some pretty good heat. Let's pour the sand back in the box so we can use it again and see what these parts look like. Man, I'm really excited how these parts turned out. It's so cool how you can take a piece of foam and shape it and turn it into something like this with some molten metal. I mean, check this out here. I mean, even the plaster comes off super easy with just pouring some water over top of it. One of the drawbacks of pouring water over top of it is it did make the aluminum a little bit kind of crumbly, so to speak, but it's not going to be a big deal for this job here. You can actually see it when I snap this apart. It's almost like I kind of heat treated it and created that little bit of a brittleness to the metal. Some of my other lost foam castings that I just let kind of cool down and didn't put them in water have been a little bit more malleable than this actually is here. It's almost like I created a kind of a crystalline structure in the aluminum, kind of like when you heat treat steel. Now, it's just a matter of grabbing a wire wheel and cleaning everything up and playing the will it rip it out of your hands and fling it across the yard game. <laughs> <laughs> and the answer is yes, I did win the lottery today and it didn't fling it across the shop because I got smart and I put it in the vise before I took it out of my hands or took off my hands, one or the other. Now let's take this back into the shop and let's do a really important step out of all this. And that's to create some reference points on the inside of that C there. These reference points are going to be really important later when we actually do the machining for putting the dial indicator in there. And speaking of precision here, I'm actually zeroing everything out so I don't cut the jaws of my vise and create a whole bunch of sadness on here. And I mean the only thing left here is, is to throw a bit of oil on here, turn this on, and let's machine this all out. Now there's no exact dimensions to this reference point, we just need it to be 90 degrees and have a really nice service finish off the two, correction, the three faces that are going to be on there. And we're, as we're actually machining this, it's a really good sign. I'm not actually seeing a lot of air bubbles or inclusions popping up. And the metal's coming off really nicely, in fact. I think the only one problem that I'm running into here is, is the tool's a little bit thicker than the actual end mill. And this is running me into having a little bit of a lip on the bottom side of this. But later on, I'm pretty sure I can take this off easily with a file or a deburring tool. And it's not going to be too big of a nightmare. I mean, keep in mind, remember, this is aluminum, so we can work this pretty fast by hand with hand tools if we need to. Let's take this out of here and have a closer look at this. That's looking pretty good. I'm pretty happy with that outcome of that. Now, let's grab a file and quickly take that burr off that I was talking to you about. And let's drag this all outside and enjoy our nice day that we're having and do a bit of polishing outside. And I've actually learned a really important lesson with all the work that I've been doing lately is before I'd actually polish things up and then machine them and, you know, little things would happen. You'd put a little nick in it here, you'd put a little nick in it there. So I'm actually going to do it in stages. Speaking of stages, some of the stuff that I've been dying for has finally arrived. And let's open up the box and see what we got inside here. First on the dock at right out of the gate, I see exactly what I'm looking for. I ordered a 22 point dial indicator set and these are gonna be the anvils for the bottom of this tool. In fact, the amount of time that it would take me to make a bunch of these and put them in the tool this was crazy. I mean, this was like 22 pieces of affordability the whole way. So I got two sets actually. Next on the list, let's have a look here. Ah, I know what this is. This is my ball nose end mill that I'm going to use on my CNC machine for cutting out some of my other foam projects that are going to be in some of my up and coming videos. You'll have to check those out as they roll out. Speaking of up and coming videos, I've got some top secret stuff here that I can't show you exactly what is, 
because it's su super cool and you'll have to check out my next Lost Film Casting video when I make a really cool machine base for something. <laughs> but in the meantime, I'm going to leave you guessing what I'm working on, but I know you're going to love this next video. Let's put this off to the side and check out what's in this other white box here. I've been really working on cleaning up my shop, and one of the things that's been really bugging me is the T-slots in my milling machine are kind of collecting all that kind of shrapnel at the bottom of it, and this is really going to help clean up that. From what I understand, when you install these, they sit pretty much flush with your table and they're not gonna get burned by your chips and it's gonna keep all that crud out of there and everything looking fantastic. And perhaps in one of my upcoming videos, perhaps the one that has my top secret stuff in there, I'll show you how easy it is to install these and how clean and tidy it's gonna keep the mill machine as we machine through the project. So let's take a closer look at this 22 point set. Now, it has pretty much every anvil that you're going to need for your dial indicator, but it's going to work really good on the base of this tool. And speaking of tools, I forgot to show you what dial indicator we're putting on this. Now, I'm pretty excited about this. This is measured to a half a thou. It's a Fowler one inch dial indicator, and this thing is pretty badass. Let's pull it out of the box and have a quick look at it. Man, this thing is, is a really cool piece of instrument for sure. Now let's get this table all cleaned up and get moving on to the next portion of this whole thing. And speaking of the right stuff, let's put this in here and show you a couple really cool tricks on how I'm going to machine this to make sure it's accurate. So here's the next trick here. Now there's probably a better way to do it other than clicking it onto the drill chuck, but this is going to work for what I need today. Now, remember that machine surface that we had for the reference point? This is what we're gonna dial everything into. <laughs> okay, and this is why I don't have anything nice. You see, I know better than tapping on that while the dial indicator's on there. Those gears inside that dial indicator are so small and so fine, that's a really good way to mess up your dial indicator. We certainly won't be doing anything remotely close to that with that Fowler dial indicator. In fact, that Fowler dial indicator is gonna be part of this whole gift that I'm giving to an old motorcycle mechanic that lives just down the road from me. And he's a pretty specific guy that's gonna enjoy this, so he's gonna take really good care of that Fowler dial indicator, let alone this whole tool that we're building. So now that we got this whole thing dialed in, and I'm reasonably happy about it, I mean, you're gonna see a little bit of movement on the way up on that, and that's actually the head of the mill machine that's out maybe a half a thou. Now what we're gonna do is, we're gonna actually find the center of this tool here from front to back. And we're gonna grab this edge finder. If you've never used an edge finder before, I actually have a video on that you should check out. There's actually a whole edge finding video that can talk to you about that, but I digress. So you can't actually see this here, but I'm actually moving the table gently into the spindle here. And you see how it just kicked off to the side there? That's telling me that I found my edge. Now I'm just gonna zero my digital readout, and then I'm gonna move this all the way over to the other side, and I'm gonna repeat the process again. Except this time, I'm gonna document what my digital readout reads when it kicks off to the side there, and then we're gonna divide that number by two. And the number I got was one inch, zero, 44 thou, and that's going to be a pretty easy one to divide in two. That's going to give me 522. And if I move it over to 522 in the digital readout, that's going to give me exactly halfway of this part. Now we'll just click zero on that so we don't have to worry about that moving. And we always can look back to there as a reference point. Now, you're probably wondering, how on earth am I going to pick off that reference point from the inside of that C? You know, the vertical one that I can't get to with the edge finder? I'm going to use a precision parallel. Now, this kind of came to me last minute, and it's going to work out really, really well for the level of accuracy that we're looking for today. This precision parallel is precision ground to one inch and 500 thou, within probably a tenth of a thou. And by holding it in there, I'm pretty sure I'm going to get this within, say, maybe a thousandth or two on finding my reference point, and I can come back to it every time. Now, we just gotta figure out what size of hole we gotta drill in here, 
because this is where the spindle hole is going to go for the dial indicator. And it's looking like a pretty standard size. It's a 3 8 spindle size, and that's going to be pretty easy to kind of manufacture. Now, all we have to do is make sure we hit this in the same spot every time. So what we're going to do is I'm going to move this over 800 thou and find it on point center. And then I'm going to zero it all out. And we got to make sure we can repeat it on the other side when we do the anvil as well. And like always, we're going to start this out with a center drill and then we're going to work our way into it. Now today I probably could have gone a couple sizes under, but I picked one size under, I think it was a letter drill, probably two or three thou under the actual size that I wanted. And we're just going to drill it one below it. That got us really, really close. I mean, that's within two or three thou. And like I said, I probably could have gone a couple below that and still had a margin of error. But let's put the 3.8 drill bit in and let's go really gingerly and nice and easy in here. And hopefully we don't blow the size too far over. And it's just a matter of moving things back to zero on the digital readout. And bingo bango, I've got it exactly where I want it. And there's no point in actually measuring. Let's grab the dial indicator and see how tight of a fit we got. That's not too bad. I mean, I'm pretty happy. It's not slopping around in there. And we're going to put a set screw in there later. That's going to hold it in nice and tight. And it's got a good vertical reference point in there to keep it nice and straight. But let's just check just to see. Well, that's 3 thou oversized. And I'm pretty happy with that. Now let's flip this around and figure out what size anvil we're going to need for this. Remember those 22 piece point anvils? Well, I totally forgot what kind of size we're gonna to need to drill in here. So I gotta jump back onto the website and check to see on all the notes to see what we're gonna to need to drill for this. Now, scrolling down through everything, it's pretty clear it tells me exactly what it is. And that's 4.48 TPI. And I'm really hoping, <laughs> because today's Friday, I'm really hoping I have this tap in stock and lo and behold, I do have a 4 by 48 I mean, I was actually really surprised. Now let's take a look on the drill chop chart, see what we need to drill. Now, it's pretty easy. We got our number drills. We got our letter drills. And I'm going to go, once again, one below the size that we're actually going to need. Because if I'm going to drill this on size, there's a pretty good chance I'm going to blow over size on this. And because of the size of the drill bit here, I'm being really, really ginger. I mean, if you've broken one of these little tiny drill bits off in your project before, you know exactly what I'm worried <laughs> what exactly what I'm worried about. So we're just gonna do a little bit of peck drilling and we're gonna come back in as we come to the bottom of the hole and we're just gonna gently ease into it. I don't wanna slam it to the bottom because that's gonna break that little tiny drill bit. And speaking of that, let's put the one size up, the actual size, I think it was a 42 that we had to drill to. And let's put this one in here and let's take it really slow and let's throw a little bit of oil on that just in case. Now, one of the problems that I actually had with this project is, is that tap wasn't going to be long enough to make it all the way through there. So seeing this problem coming, I'm going to go a bunch of sizes over and I'm just going to make a guide hole for this tap so that I don't have to worry too much about it going in straight. And I'm only going to go down maybe an eighth of an inch. And this tap's actually just going to kind of slide straight in there, straight up and down. And I'm going to use the top of that drill chuck as a guide to keep it vertical in there. This worked out really well. In fact, I was a little bit nervous tapping something so small because I'm used to a lot of bigger stuff. And I've had, like I said, I've had a lot of these little tiny things break as I'm working on them. And it's never a good story when that happens. And lo and behold, we're breaking through the bottom. And this is a whole lot of happiness. Let's take this out of the mill machine and see how these anvils are going to fit in there. Man, I'm pretty happy with that. And speaking of happy with that, 
check out the final product. Man, this thing is super sexy. I took this over to the buffing wheel and gave it a really good buffing and it came out super shiny and super sweet. What do you guys think? Why don't you throw a comment in the notes below? I'd love to hear what you guys have to say. And if you like this video, check out this video off to your left or this other one up to your right. We'll catch you on the next one and it was cool hanging out today.